So in an earlier discussion, we had talked about how in the wake of the Cold War ending, uh, civil wars began to end through negotiation. And we kind of suggested that maybe there was some sort of change happening in the international system that made that possible. We also talked about how civil wars might be a little bit difficult more difficult to resolve through negotiations and other types of, types of conflicts because the commitment problem is, is particularly acute in, in a civil war. So the commitment problem is that idea that sure we can agree to something, but once it's been implemented, once I've disarmed, once things have changed, will you continue to honor that that promise that you made to like this was how we're going to resolve this conflict? When the balance of power has shifted and suddenly I'm I'm vulnerable, are you going to betray me? And that can really inhibit parties from being able to negotiate an agreement. And what we're going to talk about today is how one change in the international system, the emergence of peacekeeping, really made it possible for um, conflict participants to work through that commitment problem and how we were able to start seeing uh, civil war negotiated agreements become the most common form of um, of conflict resolution for civil wars. Uh, so the story doesn't necessarily begin with the end of the Cold War. Certainly peacekeeping was occurring throughout the Cold War and probably even before. There were examples of peacekeeping operations under the League of Nations. But the peacekeeping operations that took place during the Cold War tended to be smaller scale. They tended to be very lightly armed, maybe not armed at all, and primarily were there as observers. So binoculars in a Jeep was essentially what you needed to be a peacekeeper during the Cold War period. But when the Soviet Union collapses and the international system sort of goes through a period of upheaval, the Secretary General Butros Butros Ghali decides that the UN can do more and commissions a report called an Agenda for Peace, which I think comes out in 91 or 92, in which it argues that the UN peacekeeping sort of structure can do a heck of a lot more than it did during the Cold War. It can do not just sort of monitoring, um, but it can also maybe help facilitate peace um, and in some cases maybe even create peace. And so it, it, the Agenda for Peace is about thinking about how the UN can shift from what it's doing, from just simply um, observing um, a lack of peace, um, what we may call negative peace, um, or a lack of violence, what we might call negative peace, to possibly helping to build more sustainable and um, and inclusive and, and um, desirable uh, peace, what we might call a positive peace. And as part of that, UN missions were gonna get larger. They were gonna have missions that expanded. And in some cases, those missions would be granted the authority to actually override the sovereignty of states under Chapter 7 um, powers that would be authorized through the UN Security Council. So we see this sort of shift in the international application of, of the United Nations and international forces, and it has a huge effect on um, the patterns we see for conflict resolution. But that's kind of confusing or um, puzzling for those of us who, who know a whole lot about peacekeeping operations. Peacekeeping forces are not strong, effective military forces in most cases. There certainly are peacekeeping operations that are carried out by organizations like NATO, which has been operating in Kosovo, but most peacekeeping operations that we're talking about, UN peacekeeping operations, blue helmet operations, um, the soldiers that make up those operations or the, the police that make up those operations aren't necessarily well trained, they're not necessarily well equipped, they're coming from a variety of different militaries because states are, are contributing peacekeepers in, and so they're maybe not necessarily integrated well into a coherent fighting force. Um, the numbers, yes, they've gotten larger in terms of the number of peacekeepers that get deployed at the mission. In the 1970s and 60s, peacekeeping forces would be 20, 40, maybe 100 people because they were just there as observers. Now it's not unusual to see a peacekeeping mission of a couple thousand. Um, I think the largest UN peacekeeping operation is in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is in the 40,000s, right? So you do get these larger forces, but in terms of military effectiveness, they're still relatively small compared to the militaries that states will field um, and their ability to control you know, large swaths of te territory, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that's a lot of space um, for a force of 40,000 to try to affect any sort of real military change on the ground. And then in many situations, peacekeepers don't really have a robust mandate to be able to use force um, much beyond protecting themselves. Their mission is oftentimes structured around um, just being a presence, um, whether that's at checkpoints or helping with disarmament and demobilization or walking the police as a, as a beat, uh, walking the streets as a beat cop. Um, 
they're not necessarily there to conduct offensive military actions, um, although it does occur in some situations. But collectively, the whole story adds up to how is this kind of a force actually altering the, the dynamics in these conflicts? And we have a couple explanations that, that we've sort of worked on in, in the social sciences. Um, one of those arguments is, is um, Barbara Walter, well, Walters with the S, but Barbara Walter, the political scientist, has argued that really we need to understand this in terms of the security dilemma and the role that peacekeeping plays in helping to reduce that security dilemma. There's other mechanisms as well. Uh, Fortnite has a couple that we'll talk about as well. But from, from Walter's perspective, um, the, the critical barrier is the, the vulnerability that comes when groups consider disarming and demobilizing as part of a peace process. Because once you start doing that, you leave yourself open to that possibility that the other side might cheat, they might betray you. They might betray you today or they might betray you down the line. And that fear um, creates a, a resistance to negotiating and a resistance to settling, even when a settlement would be you know, a, a, a much greater improvement over the status quo, the fear of what could happen if you're betrayed can, can stop that. And so there's a couple ways that we can, can respond or try to mitigate the security dilemma. Um, one is peacekeeping, right? and, but it requires an external actor to come into the situation and help assist and, and provide some security guarantees and some stability. The other option is reciprocity. This is where you're sort of handling it internally, and if the other side cooperates, you cooperate. And if the other side is defecting, you defect and, and turn on them as well and return to violence. Um, and then hopefully that a pattern of, of reciprocity will build cooperation and stability over time and, and will punish defection. But that whole story um, requires both sides to retain the coercive ability to be able to respond to a violation or a perceived violation with with a, a response in kind, potentially violence. Uh, and that kind of undercuts long term the ability to sort of move the conflict away from one in which parties are armed and, and attacking each other. So we have this problem of this maybe isn't retain this this capacity for reciprocity isn't the ideal scenario for getting the conflict to be resolved for where you have multiple groups are armed and, and able to conduct operations against each other. But in addition, addition to that, in order for reciprocity to work, you need to be able to detect when somebody is violating an agreement. You need to be able to know that they're doing something and, and do it and, and pick that up in real time. You also need to make sure that, that those violations aren't completely devastating. And that is something that might be a concern, right? If you disarm and you demobilize and you send your forces back, is it possible the other side is going to be able to, you know, secretly mobilize and strike at you in you know, the night and destroy your, you know, the core of your, your military capabilities? That kind of thing could, could be terrifying for a potential group considering uh, disarming. And there's just, in these situations, oftentimes just a lack of trust that allows for um, even just basic good faith assumptions that, that your, your adversary is working um, honestly and diligently to try to implement a peace agreement. And that becomes really important because oftentimes the process of implementing peace agreements, the process of demobilization, demilitarization is messy. Things go wrong. You know, their forces take a wrong turn at a road and end up in a village that you didn't expect them to end up on. Is that a violation or is that a mistake? And how do you tell the difference in real time? And if you're responding to things that weren't actually violations of the peace agreement, that were just accidents, do you risk um, destabilizing the peace uh, that, that might be be trying to take hold. So there's some real concerns about the viability of reciprocity as a strategy for reducing the security dilemma, reducing the, the fear that parties have. And Walter um, comes to the conclusion that really peacekeeping is going to be the mechanism that helps to get parties to not be quite as terrified about the possibility of, of cheating, about the possibility of betrayal. And it's not necessarily because the peacekeepers themselves are overwhelmingly powerful militarily. It's that they are connected to a larger international community that they can observe and report what they're seeing and that other additional power can be brought to bear. Sometimes this comes in the form of an over the horizon force. So I think in 
Sierra Leone, um, the, the peacekeepers on the ground weren't necessarily militarily powerful, but they were backed by a, a British contingent that could be called in if need be um, to provide sort of additional firepower for a peacekeeping force that found itself in trouble. Right? So that might be a way of, of you know, being able to augment um, the ability of peacekeepers to, to actually affect things on the ground. But most of the time, it's just that communication. It's that if there's a violation, the peacekeepers are gonna identify you know, who is the party responsible and they're gonna help bring an international spotlight to the conflict to create external pressure, to push people back toward um, cooperating with the a ceasefire or cooperating with an agreement. Um, and it also helps resolve those sort of situations that are ambiguous, right? Was there a situation where, um, you know, it, it was somebody took a wrong turn at a stop sign and suddenly you have a military force in a village that you, you thought was going to be, you know, um, a, a demilitarized area. Do you have intentional attacks that were designed to like claim that village? Or is it something where, you know, the soldiers were, you know, had been sent back to their barracks, but they went out drinking and they got in a fight, things escalated. Suddenly there's, there's, um, you know, violence on the ground, being able to figure out what's actually happening with those kind of situations is really important for being able to prevent potential violations from spiraling upward. And so that's, um, from Walter's perspective, a, a really valuable part of peacekeeping. Um, and, and so in, in that sense, it's not just about um, providing assurances that, that leaders are following through, it's also being able to, on the very you know ground level where individuals are carrying out you know and trying to implement the messiness of, of a peace agreement, trying to mediate through what's happening with specific instances. So if there's a conflict at a checkpoint, why did that happen? And you know, how do you resolve that in a way that allows for all parties to feel space to let things play out and let things be investigated? And that, I realize that's a little bit of um, turn around about, let me give you an example, right? So there's an incident at a, piece, uh, at a checkpoint, somebody is shot, um, decide who, who lost a soldier or who lost a, a representative is gonna be upset. They're gonna fear that this is a, a violation or this is some sort of intentional thing. There's gonna be hardliners who are gonna be calling for a military response. You can't let this go, you have to respond, you have to do something. And in the absence of peacekeeping, that pressure is going to force um, the hand of a leader to, to take a step that's probably gonna cause the ceasefire to spin out of control. With peacekeepers on the ground, it creates a space in which a leader can push back against those hardliners and say, you know what, we have a process in place. We're passing this off to the UN peacekeepers. They're investigating. They will report back. They will help us in getting justice and responding to this in a way that's going to be stable. And so it essentially buys space for the peacekeeping contingent to kind of work through and navigate that and find a workable solution to punish the appropriate individual, to provide clarity about what actually happened, and just to head off the hotheads from being able to, to blow the whole thing up, which ends up being very important as, as a part of how you can help stabilize these situations. But I prefer the explanation that it's actually not about what the peacekeepers are doing really at all that matters. Um, I, I tend to see those other things as important, but from my perspective, the critical barrier is the trust issue. Um, and that it's not just the trust of you might betray me, it's just a foundational, I don't know if you're actually committed to this, this process. And one thing that peacekeeping operations do is it gives negotiators a way to communicate to each other, I want this to work. I do. I don't want this thing to fall apart. I don't want it to come back and bite us. I'm not looking to betray you. And I can tell you that with my words and you're gonna roll your eyes and say, of course, that's what you'd say. But when I tell you that by saying, let's invite in a peacekeeping contingent to help make this thing stick, right? I wouldn't have made that offer if I wasn't serious. Now you might say, well, you know, will the peacekeeping contingent be effective or not? Yeah, we can debate about that. But what we can say is you made that offer that's going to be a potential challenge that you're gonna to have to work through if you're gonna to try to betray this whole whole process. And you are leaving yourself potentially vulnerable if you betray the whole process by bringing in peacekeepers. That's a pretty strong signal that you're serious about this. And given that um, trust and the lack of trust ends up being a, you know, a, a really challenging part of, of negotiations to resolve civil wars, once those peacekeeping um, 
overtures have been offered, that this could be a part of a settlement, um, and parties begin to trust each other, it becomes easier for them to take actions that are going to further cement and resolve the conflict. And so you could potentially argue that this becomes sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of we're doing peacekeeping because we want this to be successful and therefore we're making the concessions and the compromises and taking the steps that will actually help it to be successful now because we have the confidence that it might work. Um, all of this is very positive and upbeat and like yes peacekeeping helps um, but there are some problems with, with peacekeeping. Uh, there have been human rights violations and scandals involving UN peacekeepers um, everything from intentional actions by soldiers to poor um, um, maybe poor oversight and leadership in some situations allowing for bad behaviors and, and corruption to operate um, and there have been health and safety issues Haiti had a outbreak of cholera that ended result ended from um, a peacekeeping force coming in to help stabilize things so as positive as I am about um, uh, international peacekeeping efforts, I'm not trying to sugarcoat. I do want to um, throw that out there that there are anecdotal problems, but political scientists have also identified more of a um, structural problem with this. Um, and so this is identified as sometimes as the, the peacekeeping versus peacemaking dilemma. One way that you can do peacekeeping is uh, to have the parties um, negotiate, sit down, come to a resolution, say this is what we want to happen, and then call in peacekeepers to sort of show up after the, the hard part has been worked out and help facilitate that and, and make that stick. Uh, another way that peacekeeping can play out is that you can have a fledgling peace, right? There's maybe a ceasefire, it might last for a week or a month. There's a sense of like, maybe this conflict is ripe for resolution. And so peacekeepers get pushed into this conflict that's really still active, but maybe sort of at a window or a lull. And the thinking is if you can sort of stabilize that window, if you can stabilize that lull, it'll create space for things to, to get resolved longer term. What we find statistically is that when there's that peacekeeping force that comes in following a ceasefire, but not with like a fully resolved um, peace agreement, the negotiations on that fully resolved peace agreement tend to drag out very long. And part of this is that the impetus to resolve this conflict probably came from a mutually hurting stalemate. Both parties were looking at the situation and realizing we're not able to win and this is horrific and we don't like it and we need it. We need the violence to stop. Once you're able to stabilize that, once the, the threat of violence coming back isn't, isn't there, all that pressure and energy that says we have to change this, we have to find a way out of this problem, kind of goes away as well. And so it becomes harder for parties to sort of push outside of their demands and their insistence of, of how things want to be to build a compromised negotiated uh, settlement. And so we, we think that maybe there's an inhibiting piece that even though the ceasefire continues to hold, getting to that final resolution might be harder and maybe that's fine maybe long-term peacekeeping operations that take conflicts that would have drug on for five years and it takes 10 to 15 years to get the peacekeeping force out and get the the conflict resolved maybe that's fine maybe that's actually in the long term an okay outcome um, i think a, a final way that peacekeepers can be used is when there's an active conflict ongoing and the parties aren't necessarily interested in negotiating or resolving it we could point to this within Bosnia, we could point to this um, in Somalia in the early 1990s, both of which were situations where the UN kind of got involved in a situation where there wasn't really a peace to be kept and ended up not being able to operate on the ground, on the ground in a way that, that provided security in the way that they, they envisioned. Um, I think the United Nations has largely lost its appetite for sending peacekeepers into situations that are maybe active conflict zones. Um, rather, the focus seems to be more on stabilizing ceasefires or supporting peace agreements that have been put in place um, as, as a, a better use or a at least debatable use, uh, effective use of peacekeeping forces to support peace.